Hello, my name is Jonathan Davis and I coordinate IUCN's Global Drylands Programme. IUCN is the International Union for Conservation of Nature and we're a union of both government and civil society organisations. We contribute to developing knowledge and tools that can enable human progress, economic development and nature conservation to take place together. The IUCN Secretariat has a number of thematic programmes working on biodiversity conservation, environmental policy and what we call nature-based solutions to societal problems. Our drylands programme plays a role in restoring and sustainably managing rangeland landscapes in order to safeguard their ecosystem services. Those services are of global value and they're vital to the livelihoods of billions of people worldwide. Yet the values are poorly appreciated and are widely squandered. And this is a powerful reason to support the call for an international year on rangelands and pastoralism, which is the theme of my presentation today. Rangelands cover up to a half of all the land on the planet, depending on how you define them. They're home to about a third of the global hotspot area, which means they have both high levels of biodiversity, both species diversity and species abundance, and they provide high value ecosystem services. This map shows all of the world's biodiversity hotspots, that's the areas colored both red and green, but the red portion shows the hotspot area that lies in the drylands. Semi-arid rangelands are one of the most biologically diverse regions on the planet with a great abundance of species, many of which are not found in any other ecosystem. Rangelands are also places of great beauty and a rich source of cultural heritage. Despite being dry, they play a great role in water supply and many of the world's major river basins include rangelands. This map shows the world's major river basins, coloured according to the proportion that lies in the drylands. Roughly a third of all of these major basins, you can see, lie at least 50% in the drylands. A good example is found in Tibet, where rangelands are the source of rivers like the Yellow River, the Yangtze River, the Mekong, and others that collectively support more than a billion people in Southeast Asia. Degrading those rangelands can have a huge implication for the welfare of many people far beyond the rangelands boundaries. Rangelands include grasslands, shrublands, savannas and others. They also encompass ecosystems and habitats like wetlands and oases. And you can judge the value of these lands by the high level of competition over their resources. Many rangelands have been degraded due to conversion of key resource areas, for example, to produce crops or to expand cities. Other rangelands have come under pressure as the result of fragmentation of the landscape and disruption of patterns of mobility and connectivity. And naturally, this brings us to the question of the role of pastoralism in protecting rangeland landscapes. You might expect a conservation organisation to be most interested in wildlife in the rangelands the roaming herds of wildebeest or antelopes and you would be right this is certainly the preoccupation of many conservation organizations however the majority of the rangelands are occupied and used by livestock keepers commonly called pastoralists in most countries pastoralists manage the rangeland through a combination of strategies that include communal resource arrangements and herd mobility now there's a lot of diversity in the way these strategies are pursued around the world but there are also some common underlying elements and these commonalities point to a, a core logic uh, under rangeland ecosystems. Decline in herd mobility and decline in communal rangeland management often go hand in hand with degradation of the rangelands although of course there are many other factors it's a complex issue however in our experience we find that the key to rangeland restoration is to re-enable these strategies, to provide secure communal tenure and to equip local institutions with the skills and resources to manage herd mobility more effectively. 
And we're, it's an interesting stage in this discourse uh, on this subject because on the one hand we still have governments and, and other actors that are denouncing livestock, the livestock sector in general and pastoralism in particular for environmental harm and for destructive practices. But on the other hand we have a proliferation of examples of pastoralists that are deriving significant income from the environmental services that they provide. Bedouin communities in Jordan, for example, have changed their herding behaviour to increase rangeland productivity. And at the same time, they now derive secondary incomes from the sale of medicinal herbs. In Kenya, groups of Maasai and Samburu pastoralists manage conservancies that still make a primary income from livestock, but they make a substantial secondary income from tourism revenue and so on. IUCN houses a program called the World Initiative for Sustainable Pastoralism which has documented many similar examples from around the world. The evidence indicates that the most effective way to manage rangelands is to promote this natural synergy between pastoralism and environmental management. When everything is thrown at maximising livestock production on the rangelands the results have been mixed Livestock output may increase up to a point, but the overall decline in other ecosystem services can be astronomical. Research has shown that a more balanced production strategy, <coughs> based on the dual goals of livestock production and environmental stewardship, can give far higher overall returns when measured across the full range of goods and services. This example from Jordan gives a good illustration. This is data from a restoration project in Zarka catchment in northern Jordan, which delivered a number of measurable benefits. Economic valuation showed that the increase in livestock production was of higher value than the cost of implementation. So the restoration should pay for itself through livestock income alone. However, by far the greatest benefit was in terms of water supply almost 20 times greater than the increase in livestock production. And yet it's the downstream industries of Zarka City that will benefit from this service, much more than the Bedouin pastoralists. Although dual purpose management of the rangeland is clearly in the national interest, it may not be in the short term interests of any given ministry. After all, what does the Ministry of Agriculture in Jordan care if its land management is improving water supply for cities? or if it's contributing to global carbon sequestration. So policy instruments are needed to ensure that the ministries responsible for rangelands are also responsible for the full range of benefits from the rangelands. This may require regulations to limit over-exploitation of the land or to mandate livestock keepers to protect biodiversity or ecosystem functionality. Another option could be to invest more heavily in the secondary values of rangelands for example by establishing markets for outputs other than livestock or by developing payments for ecosystem services. This is not wishful thinking. This model of rangeland development is becoming increasingly widespread and in future could and should become the norm rather than the exception. So this brings me to the International Year on Rangelands and Pastoralism. The time seems ripe for harvest. Over the past 20 years, a great deal of progress has been made in a number of fields, and this is now converging. We have evidence of the environmental benefits of pastoralism and of the elements of good practice in rangeland management. We have abundant evidence on the economic values and economic benefits of pastoralism. And we have a growing voice on the global stage and a strength of partnership that has never existed before. Many countries now actively support this alternative vision of the future of pastoralism. And other countries are softening their stance and becoming less hostile towards pastoralists. But at the same time we face great inertia, deeply embedded misunderstandings that stubbornly refuse to die, poor policies and many ongoing biases in investment and research. This is aggravated by the legacy of decades of underinvestment 
and harmful investment in pastoralists and pastoralism. Countries now say to us, yes, we agree with what you say, but pastoralists are just too far behind and it requires too great an investment to help them to catch up. Better that we invest in the high potential areas where it's easier and quicker to deliver the sustainable development goals. This attitude is contrary to both the spirit and the letter of the SDGs, which insist on equality and the right to development. It's also short-sighted in that it fails to see what will happen if we continue to degrade and underinvest in such globally important landscapes. And in fact, it's factually wrong. Several countries, including China and India, have found that when they reverse the trend of underinvestment in rangelands, the returns on investment are higher than so-called high potential areas for the simple reason that the rangelands have been starved of investment for so long. This all makes a compelling case for an international year on rangelands and pastoralism. The international year should raise awareness of the value of rangelands and we should remind people how much they cherish these places. It's not just about the money. We can use the international year to show that pastoralists are the stewards of these lands and that they are our allies in conservation, but they cannot fulfill their role without sweeping changes in the way they're treated. The International Year will allow us to showcase all the wonderful things that are being done to secure the rangelands and it will also allow us to push back the limits of our aspiration for the rangelands and develop a much more ambitious collective vision of a sustainable world in which the half that we call rangelands can fulfil their potential. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak.